Hello, everybody. Welcome to Adventures in Producing. My name is Wendy Mitchell. I am thrilled to be doing this series looking at the careers of some amazing independent producers that I know. And uh, today's guest is none other than one of the documentary world legends. That is Julie Goldman. She is a New York City-based, Oscar-nominated, Emmy-winning producer and executive producer. Um, she is one of the founders of Mato Pictures, which came about in 2009, I think. I uh, see she has 111 credits on IMDb, so I'm not going to list those. Just to name a few, Abacus, Small Enough to Jail by Steve James, The Final Year, Life Animated, God Loves Uganda, Wiener, the Facebook series Humans of New York, the Yes Men Are Revolting, One Child Nation, The Mole Agent, Three and a Half Minutes, Ten Bullets, In the Shadow of the Moon, Golf Cruise, Ai Weiwei, Never Sorry. Uh, we can see that lovely uh, poster Buck behind her in a second. There we go. And she is working with Todd Haynes on his Velvet Underground documentary, which I cannot wait for. She has been awarded the Amazon Studios Sundance Institute Producers Award and the Center Reach Producers Award. Um, and I mentioned uh, right, she was one of the uh, execs or producers of uh, The Mole Agent, which is in the Oscar race right now. Um, I first met Julie way back in my IndieWire days in New York, and I think I may have met her when she was uh, in distribution or starting Cactus 3. And I've just watched year after year so many dozens of great films that she's worked on. So thank you, Julie, for talking to us about your career. Thank you, Wendy. It's so good to see you again. That's yes. Right. I forgot how far back we go. I know. Well, we're so young. I don't know that that's possible. It but um, so you started off working in distribution, I think, at Wellspring and well, then moved into producing. So how did that come about? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I started in distribution at First Run Features Icarus Films, actually, way back um, when I was a child. And uh, that led to, it was mostly like international co-production, that kind of a thing, which was a great foundation. Um, and then when I went to um, Wellspring, I was on the production side. I ran, I was the head of production. So I didn't really, I mean, there were like, basically what happened with Wellspring is it was a bunch of companies that were put together by a telco, like Richard Lorber's, you know, Fox Lorber and um, Wendy Liddell's company. And, you know, the, the, it was, it was like a, a, you know, like a grudge match kind of a situation. <laughs> Everybody was like vying for power. Um, but a lot of great people came out of there. I mean, Marie Therese, who was in the series that I saw, was, that's how I met her at Wellspring. So it was, um, it was a really interesting, very learning, very interesting learning experience being there. And that was a few years. And then uh, started a company with two of the people from there. And um, we worked as like creative executive producers um, at that company. And then in 2009, Chris and I started Motto Pictures. Right. And why did you know that producing was the side of the industry that appealed to you the most or would be good for your skill set? Or I mean, When I was in film school, I, I just gravitated toward it. You know, I, I realized I did not want to direct quite early. Um, and it was really interesting to me, the idea of producing. And I started to do work in every department on student films. So that I would kind of know enough that I couldn't have somebody come up to me and say something absolute that I wouldn't have an opinion about, and whether it's the electric department or, you know, production design. I wanted to at that point have a really full knowledge. Now, of course, I you know everything changes every five minutes. I try to keep up, but it's not going to happen. Um, but at the time, I realized like I would love to organize things. I love to kind of like see a palette and figure out how it can be how all of the pieces can come together there or a puzzle. Wow. And I, I should ask, where did you go to film school? Was that in New York? I went to Brooklyn College, which oh. is a very unknown film school. Um, it's mainly international students, funny enough. Um, so it's students from around the world and really interesting group of people that, that show up there. Um, and that's where I met Chris Cummins, who's my partner, my partner. Amazing. And you and Chris set up Motto in 2009, I believe. And 2010. How, 2010, okay. Yeah. 
Sorry. Uh, well, how how do you know when a project is right for Motto? And you know, how do you have a sort of USP if we're going to get corporate speak of, of what kind of work you do? No, I don't think so. I think it's more. It's it's really a, a lot of factors that go in. First of all, who is the director who's the team that's attached if it's something that's coming in or somebody that we want to work with who do we want to go to um and what the access is and what what the story is is this a story that you're going to want to like move in with for sometimes eight years um and live with and characters that you feel are really going to come through and sometimes it's the subject sometimes it's the people in the film um, sometimes it's people making the film, but it's, there's a, it's almost like there's this alchemy that like it feels right. And it's also an instinct of what, you know, you know, when you're hearing about it, is this something that's getting, if you're getting really excited, like, oh, wow, I can totally see this. This is also something that I haven't seen before mm. and something that we haven't done before. You know, when we did Buck, um, we had a lot of horse films pitched to us and I was like no no no, we're not it's not like we're like going into a genre it's that you know we really love this film for many reasons very little that had to do with horses and um and there you go you know so it's so we try to not repeat anything that we've done although we're doing a, a sequel to something right now which is kind of funny but um you know it's it's uh that's those are the the kind of factors that come into play. And it's also, it's it's me and Chris, it's Carolyn Hepburn, who's the head of production. We um, have a team, uh, Daniel Torres, Alejandro Lipen, and Samantha Bloom, who we all talk about the projects. We have new projects that come in and we have project meetings. We all give our opinions and talk about it and debate it. So it's a, a kind of an open discussion. Wow, sounds like a very collaborative uh, place. If we back up even before Motto, um, and maybe it was at your Wellspring production days, but or maybe it was Cactus 3, but what was the first film that you were involved in uh, on the production side that you really think felt like it was aligned with what you wanted to do as a producer? I mean, there were a lot of films that I really loved working on at Wellspring and at Cactus 3, but I feel like it was in a way Buck where it really came together because um, often with those films, um, we were, I was an executive producer. So, I mean, I think actually always with the films up until we did like, I did Sergio hmm. was the first one as a producer. Um, and I, that was because we were very creatively involved, but um, we weren't hands-on and then with Buck, it was like full on, hands on, on the ground in Montana, you know, hand in hand with Cindy and Toby, the editor, and Andrea Medich and Alice Henty. It was a terrific team. Um, so I would say it was the first time where I felt like, yeah, this is, even though it was late in, you know, the, the chronology of the filmography, it still was the first time it felt like, okay, I, I love doing this. This feels right. And if I could mix in, you know, executive producing and producing, then this could really be kind of a perfect, um, perfect way to proceed and make this company really shine. And, but you're a Manhattanite and who lives in Brooklyn. Did you get on a horse? Are you a horsey girl? I did get on a horse. I am not horsey at all. Um, and I did go to, I did go to like the Fresh Air Fund summer camp and, you know, <laughs> on a farm when I was a kid so I had some some horse time but uh, I got on a horse we, let's say very briefly but I I spoke to the horses I talked you know I pet the horses I fed the horses I had a lot of fun um yeah no it, it's not it's not my you know the the horses I knew were like on 89th street at the stables yes okay that's what I thought you know New Yorkers have to stick together and maintain your reputation um you know, you, you're talking in there about the mix of executive producing and lead producing or creative producing. Um, how, how do you balance that? Do you have time to be a producer producer uh, on quite a few things these days or not? Yeah, I mean, we do. Um, there's a, a lot of ways in which we balance it. One is sometimes we'll join forces with other producers so that can kind of take the, the heavy lift off a bit. Um, 
and there's like key people who we've worked with who we love to work with you know it's, it's diane becker alice henty um uh, Marilyn Ness, who we've done projects, Marilyn, Katie, Chevney. So in that way, that's, that's, and John Batsak, um, there's, you know, there's a, a lot of people that we can partner with to make it flow because we're all doing multiple projects. Um, the other thing is just having a balance on the slate that we develop and being really cautious that we're not committing to producing too many films at once. Um, because I, it, it's not directing in terms of you have to have that single pointed focus, but it's a lot. And, you know, we, we don't want to sh give anything short shrift. And, and when we are executive producers, we're creative executive producers. We're not just like, hey, let's find some money and put our name on a project. It's, it's the same, but less. <laughs> That's, I guess, the best way to put it. You know, we are not going to ne necessarily be in the field, be yeah. less, much less likely as a, as a creative executive producer. A lot of times you're not in the field, even as a producer, because you want to have the smallest footprint possible on, on some of these films. You know, if it's like Velvet Underground, where we're doing studio shoots, um, uh, then yes, we're there for all the shoots. That's different. But if it's where you're, um, you know, if it's a, a more sensitive project or if it's like Life Animated, where, you know, Owen has to, you know, our main subject has to be really comfortable and you want to have just a couple of people there. That, that's how we kind of look at it in terms of whether we go um, out in the field. But even with the, you know, creative executive producing, you know, for instance, with Mole Agent, we were very involved. We were talking all the time about what was, you know, the shoots and what was happening and the plans and what the, the challenges and what was coming up and, and very involved in the edit. And especially, you know, Chris is super involved in the edits. Um, but, you know, we are with projects we're EPing, we're also like writing grants and pitching and doing all of that. So it's, it's it's the same, but it's just less intensive. Yeah, and you know, with with all that sort of grants and the finance side and the paperwork, um, do you enjoy that side of it as much as the creative side, or you know, you can sort of balance those to I like get the, that done. <laughs> I like the challenge of it, and I like going after it um, and it, figuring it out. There is something really creative in that, yeah. actually. Um, but I mean, writing grants and you know doing agreements. No, I do not <laughs> enjoy that. Um, you know, luckily Chris Chris likes to work on, on writing grant stuff. But um, yeah, and you know the the financials and the budget and all of that. You know, Carolyn's the head of production. She really takes the lead on that. Like we talk over. I mean, I'm still like I am very very uh, fluent in budgeting. So that's still something that we talk through all the time and just trying to figure it out. And I do a lot of math in my head all day long, but um, yeah, it's, it's the, and we have a, a lawyer who does the agreements. Yeah. And I look all of them over, but I, there was a period of time where I was doing all our agreements and it was uh, insane. Nightmare. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> how many, how many iterations can you base it on from the past? <laughs> so, yeah. Whoa. Um, and you know, I, I was curious because you are somebody who I've known for gosh, two decades probably. Um, how how has the documentary world changed in the last 10 or 20 years? I mean, is it is it easier to do your job now that there are so many opportunities, there's platforms, there's cable networks, a lot more people are looking into good nonfiction. Yes. Um, or is that making your job harder somehow? kind of both. I mean, it's, it, you know, and I always look at it as these are waves, you know, when you've been doing it long enough and everybody's like, it's the golden age. They love to say that. I'm like, well, it's a golden age. <laughs> Let's see what happens. You know, it's, it's like all of those things when, you know, Netflix had that kind of burst on the scene and they paid huge numbers for a few films. And then everybody was like, oh, this is the new normal. And, and you know, we're like, well, let's see. And the next year they didn't buy anything and they built up their originals internally. And so, you know, you have to just be able to be fluid with it. Yes, there are definitely more opportunities. There are a lot more opportunities for multi-part also, which were really just didn't exist other than reality. I mean, it was uh, much more like the docu-soaps or whatever that were, were happening in, in Europe that really didn't travel here much and became reality here instead. But yeah, it's been um, there's it's it's a it's a big moment 
to be able to go out and you have a lot of different people. That said, a lot of different players, but a lot of them want the same thing. They want pop culture. They want, you know, um, music docs that don't cost too much money, which is like a, you know, impossible thing to achieve mostly. Um, and it's, they also, you know, there's, these big companies are not looking for kind of small ideas like the mole agent. Like it's not, it's not like you can go to sell that on the idea that when they see the execution, they may love it. Yeah. But that's to me a big challenge. And also there, you know, it's a little vanilla. Yeah. Or it's kind of salacious. There's a lot of true crime. There's a lot of cults, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was talking to our, our mutual friend, I'm sure Lucy Walker, um, cause you worked on Devil's Playground, didn't you? Oh yeah. That's yeah. Nice. First feature. Yeah. Amazing. Um, but this was even a few years ago and Lucy was saying, it's so annoying to even try to pitch a feature length documentary. And this was a few years ago, but she's like, because everybody wants it to be a docu-series, even when it, the subject might not necessitate that. I, yeah, that have you worked on many awesome. episodic um, we did Humans of New York, which was a series for Facebook, um, which the creator, Brandon Stanton, who's the creator of the Pony, um, he, you know, had a lot of control about how he wanted to present it. And he was fantastic to work with. Um, so that was a kind of a once in a lifetime experience. Um, then, and it was one season and it was one, one kind of 13 episodes, that's what it was. And then we did um, a multi-parter uh, called Murder in the Bayou with Matthew Galkin directing, which was on Showtime, which I think was terrific. And, you know, I, I think it really wonderful series and I hope people are still seeing it because it's, it's quite special. Oh, I'm going to turn off my alerts. Um, so, yeah, so, and we're developing a couple of them right now and you know, back in the day, we did Office Tigers as a four part with Liz Merman. Oh, like yeah, that. Liz Merman. Yes, yep. another friend. So, you know, it's been, you know, and we did, I did Family Bonds, which was a kind of HBO's first non sex series, <laughs> non sex or autopsy, <laughs> series, um, which was, I, I, I love that. It's like a 10 parter. And um, it was this moment where they had a slot right after the wire, can you imagine? And um, it was the opposite kind of. Uh, people in the film, in the series that were in the wire that were in family bonds. But um, it was, the thing is the wire had no ratings. And so oh it was a terrible lead in. And it's just so crazy. Cause it's like, oh, it's one of the, you know, I think two best series ever. So, um, but that was a, kind of, again, these moments that come up. And I think right now in a way there's, that's this moment of this year because we were able to keep moving with nonfiction where fiction films and series obviously had to stop because the enormity of the, the crew and the cast. So and it's a yeah. Movie. Yeah. And would you, have you ever done any fiction? Would you do fiction or have you tried to adapt any of your documentary ideas into fiction? Funny you say that. We have a short that we did uh, for Amazon called Cassandra, called Man in the Mask. Um, and it's Roger Ross Williams um, directed it and it is now being adapted into a feature that's going to be his feature debut. Wow. Fiction feature debut. So um, yeah, so that's really exciting. So that's something that we're working on. Um, and I think more and more, you know, the films that we are um, producing our, you know, Sergio was remade as Sergio. <laughs> it's funny they keep the same names um, for Netflix that Greg Barker directed. Dan Krause adapted The Kill Team as The Kill Team um, uh, with Alexander Skarsgård. And, uh, you know, so that it's happening more and more. The Mole Agent is, is in discussions for remake. It's become something that, you know, you're supposed to now look at the film and what you're doing as IP, like can it become a spin-off series or a remake or a podcast or, you know, like we're developing a podcast while we do a film that we're doing that we kind of pitched as a series and a film and a series and a film. We couldn't, you know, it, we still think it's, you know, would be a great series. So because there's and it's a lot of um, wiretaps and audio recordings. So we were like, okay, let's do a podcast as a series. That sounds 
interesting and fun. Do you like working in this sort of multi-platform world? Absolutely. I think it yeah. keeps everything. I mean, to me, I, I want to feel like everything is, stays fresh and that we're not in these. What doesn't happen is that we kind of just do the same thing again and again. I'm easily bored, I think. So yeah. no, I love this idea. I love podcasts. So why? And if it can be a companion, that's fantastic. And same with the, you know, the idea of these, these remakes and Abacus has also been optioned for remakes. So yeah, so it's, it's again and again, this has been kind of the new, the new normal. Wow. And you've just hearing all these films you've worked on, it's such an amazing roster um, or filmography, really. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit more about some of each of, not each of the films, because that would take days, but um, a few highlights. Um, you mentioned Abacus, Small Enough to Jail, and this is yeah. from Steve James. Was this the first time you worked with Steve? Yeah, kind of amazingly. I mean, we've known each other forever, but it was the first time we worked together. And we're, we're looking to see something to work on again. I mean, the thing is like Steve is, has this kind of wonderful setup in Chicago. Um, and the producer of that film, Mark Mitten, is based in Chicago, and they had done the Roger Eber film together. And, you know, he has Cartemquin mm -hmm. as, like, the production company that he works with on, on pretty much everything. But this story was set in New York. So we had um, the product, we basically ran the production in New York. We had Tom Bergman, who's a cinematographer we work with all the time. Um, Sean Lyoness, who at that point worked for Motto, um, was the kind of point person. So... Yeah, so it was, um, it kind of worked perfectly in that way. Cool, and that was episodic? I haven't actually no. seen that one. That's, a, it's a single feature. It's okay. true. Oh, it's so good. Yeah. <laughs> On the my family, list. The family in it is amazing. It's, okay. this, um, it, it's basically this family who are prosecuted for the, <laughs> the, the bank collapse um, with, the, it's a small, uh, family-owned bank in Chinatown. That's the only one that, that was prosecuted. So uh, our DA Cyrus Vance uh, at work. <laughs> and, you know, we've mentioned the mole agent, which a lot of people are aware of this year, which is just such a fantastic watch. And, you know, I, I did an, uh, a Q and A recently with uh, Maite for, for BAFTA, I think. And, yeah. you know, I think some people might think it's all contrived, you know, but, it's, it's a perfect. It's you know, so perfect. You couldn't script yeah. it, you know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it was like that was there. I mean, we pitched it. We pitched it at Infa, and we were at that point. It was very early days, and I mean, it's a it's an interesting story because Maite was a decided to do something about wanted to do a film noir documentary about a private de detective found this guy, and was an intern in his office for a couple of months, and. He, she found that there was a case that she thought was interesting and the main mole broke his leg. I mean, that, that's not in the film. None of that was really in the film, but that's so that's so that he had to um, put out an ad for somebody who would do this and like 80 to 90 year old men came in to like answer this ad and she was astounded at how many older men, old, older guys were up for doing this. And ultimately Sergio was the one who was chosen um and you know she she right away was like oh my god this guy's amazing i mean you just feel like his humanity his compassion he's such a tender person and you know he's with this like private detective who is just a bulldog so it's it's a very funny there's a ton of stuff with the two of them that did not make it into the film oh. but kind of the amazing thing is like the timing of it you know it came out and and the idea was like kind of it's never too late to have an adventure. It's never too late to, to live. That was the original idea. Then the pandemic hits and it's really about like call your, call your, your family, call your olders, mm -hmm. your elders, your, you know, your older family members. And that became something that was actually happening, which was kind of wild. So and it's like from Sundance when we premiered and we were like talking, everybody's like, yeah, I do need to call. And then, you know, a few months later, that's all they had to do was to call these folks. So. Yeah, because that was Sundance 2020 um, with that one. And God, it's such, it, it's so, yeah, the sort of humanity of this film, I just love, but it's so entertaining yet moving and funny and real. And um, I mean, yeah. are you, I guess you're happy with your Oscar nomination? We were thrilled. I mean, first of all, Maite <laughs> is an amazing person to work with. She's a, 
really talented director, but also just a lovely, lovely person. And Marcella, um, who's her producer on it, was phenomenal, you know, and like kind of just rose to the occasion every time. So we worked really closely with them. We're still working really closely with them because, I mean, it's been interesting because this film doesn't have any of these kind of deep pockets. Um, it's not funded by a streamer, yeah. you know, funded by PBS and public broadcasters in, in Chile and Germany and Spain and Holland. So it's been very different in trying to kind of get notice and get attention. And so we were really proud also that, I, I, I think it should give hope to films that are like not in the English language and that are, you know, in really independent. Um, to that, that, that if people see the film and they love it, it can rise. Yeah, you can cut through the noise just with a great small film. Um, it does give me hope that these awards campaigns aren't just about money. Um, yeah. So yeah, a few of those nominations really cheered me up. Um, okay. Yes, um, another director I know you love working with is Nan Fu Wang, um, who you made One Child Nation and In the Same Breath, maybe more, or just those, those two? Are the, the two and then we're developing a new project, but yeah. Okay. Um, and how did you meet Nan Fu and start collaborating with her? You know, I saw Hooligan Sparrow and I was like, who is this badass? You know, I've got to meet her. And I, I think I saw it at Sundance and then I, I was at some event or something and, and um, we started talking and I was just like completely, you know, smitten right away because she is, she's so smart and she's, um, she's just incredible. I mean, actually traveling with her on One Child Nation, like she's, 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 we were having breakfast one day and she goes, yeah, every year I start out and I like, I want to learn something new. Like this year I'm taking painting lessons and, and then I set my goals and then I check in with my goals. I was like, oh my God, I am so lame. <laughs> you I know? Need that. I was looking at that and I was like, you're, uh, I got felt like me, but yeah, she's really, you know, uh, she's really inspiring. Yeah. And when you're making films about China, um, how concerned do you have to be about the legalities or you know that your subjects getting identified if they're going to get in trouble with the government there or we anything like that? The, we you know and also Jalin uh, Zhang who was her um, co-director on One Child Nation and one of the producers on In the Same Breath um, and Nan Fu they're really um, terrific with that. I mean we have we get a lawyer that specializes um, in either is in China or specializes in. in Chinese law. We have lawyers here. Um, and then we have like vetting through PBS in that case and Amazon or this case through HBO. You know, it's we, we go through very, very um, rigorous vetting. And so it's, you know, it's, it's somebody often you're like, wow, that person get in trouble. But that person we know has, has been out there. They have a blog. They're publicly speaking. They're, they've been interviewed on the news. So we're not breaking news about that. We're just continuing whatever their, um, you know, political outreach is. So, in, so it's that or, um, you know, a lot of times it's people who are in the U.S. who are, talk, you know, like in, in One Child Nation, a lot of those folks were in the U.S. that were talking about it, the, the, the people that were, um, you know, kind of pushing uh, to, you know, expose the policy and what, what had happened. Or, you know, again, there's somebody who, um, who's actually not saying anything against the policy. You know, that's, that's the thing. They're, they're not saying anything negative. So it's just what they're saying in cut in with what else you're seeing in the film kind of amplifies the, the message of the film. And speaking of legals, um, you mentioned Life Animated by the wonderful Roger Ross Williams. Um, how much was Disney involved, aware, uh, giving their blessing? <laughs> they were aware, you know, we went to um, A&E Indie Films to Molly Thompson when she was there. And um, we were like, you're our first stop, we wanna go here. And part of the reason, um, in addition to wanting to work with Molly um, and having it be one stop, sh one stop shopping and also knowing that they could fund the whole, the whole thing um, is that they, they're half owned by Disney. Well, it ended up not making a bit of difference. You know, like all your plans, like they, they just, they, they were like, they're like relatives who kind of know each other. Um, so we then um, went to Sean Bailey, who's the head of production at Disney through Carrie Putnam at Sundance, 
he's on the board of Sundance. So she introduced us and he was like the guardian angel for that film. I mean, he kind of walked us through everything. We had to go out there and pitch the whole team at Disney, which is like legal, business affairs, uh, marketing, you know, the animation group, the, you know, like everything. And there was like a giant boardroom. Everybody was there. People were introducing themselves to each other. That's how big that company is. It was crazy. We had like index cards and we were shaking, you know. And so we had to do a presentation and then they were, you know, they basically were like, just let's talk along the way, you know, and, and don't, you can't like when we, we created the animation for Owen's short story, the animation of uh, the film within the film, we did it with a company in France and we had to show them some kind of like style frames because we couldn't have it look exactly, they're really talented animators. They couldn't look exactly like the characters really look. So it had to be interpretations that kind of a thing same with the poster the poster was a nightmare <laughs> you know I wrote a book about dogs in movies and of course there's so many Disney films and I found out in the process of writing that that Disney is the most sort of litigious of the yeah. studios oh yeah um and luckily I, if anybody from Disney is watching I will say I got all of mine cleared through a photo agency so all legal um well it's true I mean there was a lot of that was a lot of the anxiety around it certainly for the financiers but we just also, the other thing is on Buck, I had worked with Paula Potter and clearances who, because it was uh, the horse whisperer was, um, we had clips of it obviously with Buck. Yeah. So I, she was like, hey, you know, we had just worked together and um, she was amazing. And between her and Sean, I mean, it was, it was complicated. We had to get the voices, you know, for all the films in there that you had to clear the actors, the music, but yeah, it was, it was a real bear that one and and unfortunately that a lot of that went like I had to kind of oversee all of that so um in the end it was like they gave us a decent deal and we paid for everything and everything was buttoned up um and they let it they were really happy with the film I mean it's such a gorgeous film um but you know, you should get a medal. This is why I want to talk to producers because so people realize them. what happens. <laughs> if I was going to get a medal, that would be the one. That was yeah. Really cool oh my, yeah. I can't even imagine. Um, what about Wiener? Was that legally tricky? Yeah, that was legally <laughs> tricky. Um, that you know, so Josh Kriegman and Elise Steinberg. So Josh had been chief of staff for Wiener um, when he was in Congress. And so he had a very close relationship with him or, the, or comfortable enough relationship that he could show up with the camera. It wouldn't feel like something out of the ordinary because he's used to seeing Josh. Um, so he really went in, they got, they got all of the material um, very, you know, over this period of weeks. And then we met them and saw some of it. And I was like, Anthony Weiner, like who cares? And I just saw the stuff and I'm like, oh my God, we were all like, we care. Totally stunned. Yeah. And, it was very tense. I will say that it was very tense. We had releases, um, amazingly, um, <laughs> and also they were very obviously cooperating on camera. You know, even if we didn't have releases, there was nothing that they were saying or doing that they were like, "Don't do this. Don't show this." When they said, "Don't show this," you see the camera go off. You know, that's that's that moment. So, I mean, you would think. And I, I, I still astounded that they allowed that. Yeah. Especially who would that. sign releases for some of that? Okay. Well. Well, that's he did. Great. Yeah. So, but at the same time, you know, it was there was so much tension. I mean, I, I swear, Josh was like a walking cigarette. You know, by the time we had the <laughs> premiere, and we had the premiere at Sundance, and it all had led to that. And there were all of these things going on. We had also decided. It, there was so much anxiety about what could happen and if this was going to reflect badly on the Clinton campaign or anything like that, which obviously had nothing to do with that. So it never, they had their own issues. So um, I was like, if they're, if in the end, if their biggest problem was Wiener, they would have been thrilled. Um, so, I mean, not him, he was the problem, but I'm saying the film. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, the premiere, it was like, they just couldn't believe it. It was so great. Everybody loved it. It was over and they kind of came over and they were like, can we go home now? I'm like, oh, you have four more screenings. They're like, we can't do it. We can't stay. Like, we're, 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 that's it. And then of course they stayed and then they won the grand jury prize and they were very happy to be there. So it was, but it was really, it was, it was the, 
it was thick tension. And we had decided, as I started to say, to sell it ahead of time. So we mm. sold it to IFC Films and Showtime because also going in there with corporations in that case made a lot of sense. Yeah. And just in general, are you doing you know straight deals with the platforms at that sort of commissioning stage now? Anything with them or with Netflix or Amazon or any of those? Yeah, so we, um, both ways. I mean, we're bringing them projects, but we're also getting projects that come in from them. So um, that's been actually, you know, it, it's kind of kept us alive in a lot of ways this year. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we just, we look at the slate and we're like, okay, we want to do a certain amount that are like fully commissioned. Um, and then we're going to keep doing the films that you're, we're piecing together. That you originate, yeah. Yeah, and then sometimes we'll, you know, we'll just bring like in the same breath. It was, you know, we knew we had. To, I mean, it was, it was a, it was a rolling machine at that point. You know, we had to get going because obviously what was happening with the pandemic. But you know, Nanfu and Jalen had really started gathering material, and um, so we went to a couple of places and we pitched it, and HBO was absolute. Like we we knew from the first minute that we started talking to them that it was going to be with them. Yeah. So, and that they fully funded it. It's, you know, an HBO film. So that, that kind of a thing, which is great. Um, You know, if it was something where we had more time to develop it, because we had gotten actually development grant for Hmm. very quickly um, or two, and then we gave them back. (laughs) I mean, which is really crazy, but we were like, this, especially at that moment in the pandemic, we were like, you know what, people really need this. And yeah. we just got, you know, the, the what do you call it? The, when you get the, the hook mm-hmm. or the, the ring at okay. the merry-go-round on the carousel. Yes, and you grabbed just, the brass ring. The brass ring. So, you know, why would we take it? But it was, it was really interesting. So now, of course, we're doing a new project. We're like, can we have that money now, please? <laughs> Uh, that sounds like typical true documentary. That's great that you could just go to a one stop and, and get it made. Um, and then Mole Agent is like completely different, you know. Yeah, you, Mole Agent together. is pieced together the, the old fashioned way, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. As was One Child Nation before yeah. Amazon came out at Sundance. And um, I have to fangirl um, and ask about Todd Haynes, Velvet Underground. Um, you know, Christine Vachon, his usual producer, is working on the film as well, I guess. Or when did you come on board? So um, Universal Music Group, Polygram, uh, David Blackman there had kind of, I guess, brought the film to Todd and Christine. And then they wanted to have a documentary company as the production company because Todd's never done a documentary. And so they brought it to us. So that was one that was like fully funded, brought to us. And we we're like, wait a minute. Todd Haynes, Velvet Underground, you know, can we pay to work on this? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this, that was a dream. Um, and it was amazing. I mean, you know, we didn't know what would happen because, you know, he's never done a documentary and, you know, you hear about um, fiction directors who kind of, you know, helicopter in periodically during the edit or do a couple of key shoots, uh, key interviews. And from the very start, like this, he has this film in his DNA. This is like the film he was built to make. and. It's perfect for his documentary debut. I don't know if he's going to want to do more documentaries, but it's perfect. And um, he had a vision for it. It was, you know, just from the very beginning. And he was there. He did every key interview in the film. And he was an editor with the other two editors, Fonso and, and Adam. Um, like he had his own system and they would work together. You know, it was, he was really hands on. Yeah. And the first interview we did was Jonas Mikas, actually. Wow. Yeah. And we. Went I mean, to- I've, I've, I, I can't say, I can't name drop that Todd is a friend, but I've interviewed him, and he was one of the most thoughtful human beings I've ever encountered in my life. Um, so I can't wait for this film. Yeah. He's exactly that, and and he's an artist, and this is about artists, and he yeah. gets it in a way that um, a lot of people would not. Yeah. It's not just like wonky, you know, love the music. It's it's really deep and it's a lot about that era and the art and the, the avant-garde filmmaking and the avant-garde movements that were coming out. And it's yeah. it's it's an extraordinary film. Um, maybe I'm not even allowed to ask, and especially in a pandemic year, but do we have any idea when it will be out? Um <laughs> well, yes. Um I 
think it will premiere at a festival in the next several months and okay. then it will be released uh hopefully late summer or fall I okay mean, so in 2021 we're gonna see this film yeah yeah yes absolutely yeah, we can keep it a bit vague yeah oh yes, but the other thing is i mean you know people have been saying it's going to be at sundance like every year <laughs> but i mean don't forget todd left we had to kind of freeze for a while and adam and fonz kept editing but um he went and made dark waters so yeah we, stopped and took the time because that's the thing Todd is an artist and he is focused on what he's doing he's not doing 10 things he's not one yeah. of those people that's you know developing 20 projects so he did Dark Waters and then you know he came back <laughs> and then the pandemic hit and he was you know like going into the edit room more time in the edit room great I don't know it's really oh. really gorgeous okay I, that's given me hope for the last part of 2021 um and we didn't really talk so much about Alison Clayman. Uh, do you have something new with her? Can you tell us anything about that or just why you like working with Alison? I love working with Alison. We love her, she's so great. And we did Ai Weiwei, which was her first film. And then um, 100 Years Show, uh, which is a short about Carmen Herrera, which is a really special film about a 100 year old artist. Um, and then we did Take Your Pills for Netflix, which is about like kind of the ADD, um, medication explosion um and she's just great to work with she's so creative and clever and um so we're developing something new which i think is going to be multi-part cool. i'm very excited about it um yes watch cool. this space um and there's uh, i try to end asking people some of the same questions so my first is about pet peeves and if it's fiction producers, I ask, what are your pet peeves on set? But with a documentary producer, what are your pet peeves throughout the process? Um, it could be on a shoot, it could be, you know, the legal paperwork. Well, what's your pet peeves about this business? <laughs> uh, one pet peeve is everybody thinks they, they're a documentary filmmaker. Um, and there's a lot that goes into it that people don't realize. Um, uh, another pet peeve is, you know, general, I think probably for documentaries is, and probably for, for fiction as well, you know, there's uh, undervaluing of the producer and the work that the real creative partnership that it is. Yeah. Um, you know, you're everything. You're the therapist and the parent and the banker and the accountant and the, you know, uh, travel agent you know you're doing everything um as carolyn says you're putting down the tracks she loves that expression you know as the train is going so um and i think the the another pet peeve is that not just that everybody thinks they're documentary filmmaker it's like everybody is jumping on a bandwagon and that's gonna that that's not gonna be really good for it you know i think the fact that everyone now thinks that they should have documentary as part of what they do um, you know, I, I worry is going to corporatize it and make it all IP. Mm. Um, so, yeah. I have a lot of pet peeves. I could go all day. Yeah, it. no, I, I'm I mean, going to do a whole it. hour of pet peeves at some point. Um, and you've kind of went into it there, but what do you think people either in the business or, you know, your cousin misunderstand about what a film producer does? Oh, everything. <laughs> I have no idea what it does, what a film producer does. I mean, really it's, I mean, I think that what has happened in these last few years, and there's like a gathering of people at uh, Sundance, um, the producing lab uh, in, in documentary space that people were like, we really, you know, that it's, we have to have a voice. There's the DPA started. Um, uh, Marilyn Ness, Beth Levison, a bunch of people started this and did a white paper essentially mm -hmm. on, you know, what, producers do in documentary and what should be recognized. So um, I think there's been a lot of headway in the industry and there's also um, structures that are being created to, um, you know, for crediting and for um, fees and for, you know, just to, to try to standardize a little bit that there, it, there has to be a baseline. Yeah. Um, but I think it's, it's what I said before, it's like, you're, you're really across the whole picture and you're supporting the creative vision and often part of um, really developing that creative vision with the director. 
Um, the best films are partnerships and you're just working together uh, from the start. And the, you know, the director has to then be the front person when the film comes out, which I think is a difficult for a, a, a lot of people um, to handle, but it's, you know, I think more and more there's a recognition and certainly with film festivals often now there's a recognition that the producer should be up there at least at least for the q a if not for the intro yeah oh i think my god you so need to be up there um producers need to take their bows um thank you so much julie um what a creative powerhouse you are a producer extraordinaire um i can't wait to see the next 111 credits no pressure on it, Wendy. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, but we will be rocking out with Velvet Underground later this year. Um, thank you so much and stay safe. Thank you. You too. Great to see Thanks. you.